This is Bliss Oasis. Change your thinking, change your life. Tunza Kenya is a non-government organization. It's a, it is an NGO. Okay. And as, a, and as I have explained, we realized when we, uh, before we used to do it as a program, I mean, as a, an, um, an outreach program uh, from our other company, okay? But we realized this is a huge, huge, huge challenge that uh, this, it can't run um, as a program at any other entity. Mm. So we, I personally went out of my way. Mm. I invited a few people whom I thought we could work around with in, in um, establishing the uh, the organization. Mm. So it's only last year that we got the certification as a non-government organization, as an right. NGO. So okay. as an independent board, mm. uh, uh, we have uh, people running, okay, we have a person who's running it on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes. I have shifted from my main job at SS Media to come mm. and sit the setting up of uh, Tunza Kenya. So I'm part okay. of the, uh, the initiators. Mm. So yes, that's who we are, is an NGO, and uh, we look forward to mitigating matters of mental ill health in Kenya and perhaps beyond. Welcome again to Bliss Oasis Africa, where you go out there bringing you the untold stories of everyday people. But sometimes these everyday people may bring their own personal stories, but some of those stories touch the whole person, they touch the whole community. And today we are talking about mental health. What is mental health all about? Some time ago, I used to think mental health is concerns those people who are running a mock around the road, the mad people people who are supposed to be hospitalized with Madare. But later on, I discovered that is not the issue. And I discovered later on that there are so many healthy looking people walking all over the place. They look healthy, they look good. They're smiling with you, they're chatting with you. Two days later, you hear they've murdered all their family. They've committed suicide. And you wonder what the hell is happening. To help us unravel this issue, we are glad, or rather I'm privileged and I'm happy to invite George Kemando. George Kemando is a long, is a long standing friend of mine. He is all over social media. You have seen his posts on Facebook. Maybe he sent you one or two things on up. But George Kemando is quite a number of things and he's going to tell us about it because as far as I know, He's a publisher, or he was a publisher. I don't know whether he's still a publisher. He'll tell us about it. But he's also involved with mental health. Now, mental health, Ziwe Ndawazimu, Ratambia Vizuri. Welcome, George. Tell us, Karibu Kwanza. Karibu Kwanza Kwa Bliss House in Africa. Thank you, Patrick. Yes. I'm happy to be here. And thanks for your invite. And uh, I look forward to sharing what I can with you and your audience. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Welcome. I, I've been trying to organize this interview with you because I know the situation in the country. Many people are blaming COVID. COVID since COVID, Kuje, what was it? Makazi. People are not okay because there's no money. But we know people used to commit suicide. People used to do stuff even before COVID. And you tell us about in details about that. But before we go there, for these people, for those people who may be hearing or seeing you for the first time. Who is George Kemando? Where, if I may use the word, where the hell did he come from? <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. I like the way you introduced it. Uh, well, I do come from hell number one. Yeah. Uh, but George Kemando is a part of many things in one. I am um, a teacher by profession. Yeah. I may not know that actually my first qualification was actually uh, B. Ed, and I taught for some time. Okay. I then went to the media. I I I have a master's in communication. Mm. I have a PhD, which is half done, uh, still on communication. But what brings me here a lot is uh, the. Um, but after my mainstream media practice, that is about fifteen years ago when I left uh, the National Media Group, I focused a lot on what I call essential media. 
And social media uh, basically means refers to those media platforms that are largely neglected by the mainstream media. And here I'm talking about things like health, things like education, things like environment, and basically information that will bring change to people in their very, very own settings. And um, the one I, I, I have done longest is health communication. Okay. Uh, since about 2005, 2006, yeah, that's when I started a journey on health communication. And I'm very proud to say this without uh, I mean, at the risk of being not immodest. That was among the pioneer people who brought issues on health communication to this country. Uh, at that time, we, uh, we were being asked, what is health communication? But uh, about 15 years later, we have even the mainstream media houses setting up um, specific desks for health reporting and communication before we didn't have that yeah. um, and this is one of the things that has been aided a lot by the world health organization we have been doing that in the in a cohort of 17 african countries and kenya is one of them in fact i've been a point person in the region to do that mm -hmm. and today we have um, another thing that i have uh, spearheaded and i'm proud of actually is the fact that we have gotten um, a curriculum for communication in medical schools oh, in okay. kenya Oh yes, today today we have uh, a component of communication uh, going out to uh, medical students. Uh, so far, we have got um, in the region we have four medical schools who have taken up that curriculum. Mm. That is the University of Nairobi, KU, Mo University, and St. Mulumba in Bakerere. Mm. And then Jay Kuat <coughs> actually took up the the, uh, the challenge, and we were involved in that. And they have the first PhD course in health communication, okay? So I can uh, say without, um, well, as I said, at the risk of being noting more I was among the pioneer people who brought that concept around and it's taking root. And the reason we did that was because we have a lot of um, ignorance uh, and, 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 and our focus was to demystify medicine and take it to the lay person in a way that they can understand it Mm. in their own settings. Um, I, I, I might also mention that about 70% of the cases that escalate to see a doctor don't need to. If people are well informed about mm. certain health aspects in their own environments, mm. they don't need to see a doctor actually. And, and that's about 70% of the cases. And that tells you about a gap that is there in terms of health communication. Um, so. In summary, that has been my progress in health communication. But yes, I have been in other areas. And that's why I said that, uh, I'm about to make the things. I also teach part-time. Oh. I, I, I pastor in oh. terms of not in a church per se, but I give talks of social engagement, yes. including uh, things to do with religion, with marriages, the relationships. Yeah. I've been very key on that one also. But, and by the way, that is also a very key component of health, of good health to people, yeah? Marriage. I have also been, uh, <clears throat> oh yeah, uh, marriage, relationships, you've done a lot of that uh, stuff. Mm. I've also been a publisher mm. of diverse uh, publications, which I had you mentioned that, you don't know if it happens today, but what we have done is to diverse a lot into digital publications. Okay. Uh, and that covers uh, health. Again, I mean, that's my pet. Uh, health, there is uh, education, mm. there is environment, and then there's one we did of late called Invest Kenya, which is about investment and tourism promotion, more okay. so through the counties. That has been largely since about a year ago. And much as that is going on, I have a new baby, which I think is what you want us to focus on a lot today. Yes. Uh, the new baby is called Tunza Kenya. It's called what, sorry? Tunza, Kenya. Tools. Tunza, Tunza is in Nasha. Oh, Tunza, Tunza, Tunza. Tunza, Tunza, Kenya. Tunza, Kenya. Is, um, Tunza, Kenya, yes. That is um, a non government organization that we formed about a year ago. It has been there as a program in our other company. Mm. But then this we realize, uh, um, and it is, uh, and the main thrust of Tunza, Kenya is to mitigate mm. on mental health challenges in this country. Okay, so before we used to, oh, sorry, if I just um, finish that bit that we have had a lot of uh, issues in our other company about mental health issues, but then we realized it's, it is such a huge gap mm -hmm. and not many people are talking about it. So mm -hmm. that's why we focus on it. And then we realize it cannot run at any other entity. 
So mm. we formed a platform by itself. That's where we have with uh, Tunza Kenya. Okay, we'll come to we'll come to Tunza Kenya, but mm. in a nutshell, um, I also discovered that we are birds of trade, or rather, birds of a feather, because being a journalist and once working with the nation, you are also there mm. the nation. But I think that was a yes, yes. that must be years after I left. And I remember, I so. yes, I remember there was, there's still a, the nation, is it called Nation Health or Health Nation mm -hmm. magazine? Health Nation. Yes, which was uh, introduced because of same same issue, same problem of uh, they are not having enough information about health. But I remember when I was there, it used to look, it used to be more of a, a department of a newspaper which would sensationalize such health issues so that people can buy the newspaper. I don't know whether I'm sure you are there. I mean, I'm sure during your time there at the nation, you used to look at, to see that magazine. And do you think it was having um, the, the 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 readers the way it should? Uh, thank you for that question, Patrick. I think the biggest challenge you have had with the media houses, and I have been there, uh, I mean, and you have been there before, I've been there before, I can tell you this for In fact, the reason that I focus on that particular element of, of health communication is that the gaps have been there. Even with that health nation thing, yeah. that is more or less like just reporting. And uh, um, the reason we got very involved in that is because uh, we had a lot of, as the writers say, uh, we'll take. Um, a health story and make it sensational. You know, at the school of journalism, we were told about um, the story means, I mean, the, uh, the story is when man buys dog. Yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, I, and actually, I can give you a very good example. Um, some 10 years ago, about that's about 2010, there was a time that Kenya was left out of the then funded by the Global Fund on HIV issues. Mm. And the reason was there was uh, there were gaps in their accountability. Yes. Not that the money has been misused. Actually, what happened is that you see, global fund will give funds to the Ministry of Health, yeah. and where the programs are supposed to be undertaken, sometimes there was not even infrastructure to handle the programs themselves. Mm. So what the minister did was to get some of the money and divert it to construction of infrastructure to host the program, right? And then, of course, the issues were raised by um, by the Global Fund. Mm. And I remember the then Minister for Public Health, Ben Mogul, uh, issuing a statement on the same. The next day, all the main headlines of the mainstream media yes. were like, our government denied funds because of corruption. Wow. <laughs> <They do. laughs> <laughs> and I remember Ben Mogul was very mad with it. Mm. But then I was telling them, but this is what um, happens when you don't have uh, people who are trained to mm. report on essential media. I mean, that is yes. part of it, you know. Yes. So I hear you. it is very true. So the Health Nation thing, which is there even today, and I think there's also something in the standard, mm. it's uh, what I may call an attempt to address that, but it's not yet. It, uh, it is not where we ought to be. Yes, you know, because I would like whereby uh, someone will uh, go for the dust with the nation where I think it appears, I think, uh, um, health nation, I think appears on that, if I'm not wrong, mm. whereby somebody will be waiting, you know, because this is something that, that is very, very well choreographed and aware and very, very informative mm. that it will give me the information that I need in terms of health and maybe even go further than that. Mm. To, uh, to, 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 to also provide um, a platform, um, um, maybe digitally that mm. someone can go and get uh, effective health information about their own settings. Yes. And I don't think in the current setup, by, by now, such media having been around for almost 60 years, some of them are 100 mm -hmm. years, they have yes. not that, they have not had that department that can give the kind of service you're suggesting. You know, and Patrick, this is, uh, yeah. sorry, go on. Yes, and then uh, again, uh, the dilemma of the reporter, having been a reporter myself, you are not trained in that area of health, for example. You don't know the details. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when you are sent to a technical kind of event where you have to report, 
you go to your news editor with your report, who knows almost nothing about medicine or health, and they look at the sensation angle only so that they can sell the paper. While also, True. while also the so-called, I'm sorry to use the term, so-called uh, science editor or health editor may not have too much knowledge on the same. And so they just pick a few bits and pieces to just fill the weekly magazine. Unfortunately, that is very true. And that's what happens a lot of times. Because in this country, and that is the gap we have come, we, uh, we have attempted and we are still in the process of plugging in, <coughs> sorry, uh, so that we can have, um, and I've just told you about that um, program we have with the World Health Organization, Yes. To train journalists uh, and media houses basically to establish fully fledged and effective uh, health communication desks in their mainstream media houses. So, for instance, I'll give you an uh, So far, we, uh, we only have one, one doctor who is a journalist in this country, mm. and whom I'm a very, uh, um, um, right now she, uh, she works for KTN. I don't know if you have watched Dr. Masako Rir. Mm -hmm. um, it has a program there. I, I think two programs. One are called Health Digest. Yes. And another one called uh, and another one that focuses on doctors' uh, stories and all that. Yes. And uh, she uh, she was actually our intern at some point. Uh, and when she was in medical school, and then after uh, she finished, uh -huh. she uh, she went that route. Mm -hmm. Now for her, she has managed. Although she still has a lot uh, of things to do, maybe because of the constitutions of the media houses themselves. Uh, she has tried a lot to bring professionalism and, 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 and professionalism in the reporting of health matters. Okay. And that's the journey we should go to, um, um, to us, whereby uh, even, um, I, I do understand, you and I know there are a lot of restrictions because as you say, you bring that to Patrick Gogge, who is the, 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 the ME for the magazine and um, he looks for what can sell here. It's not just about the technical aspects, mm -hmm. but how can we make it be sensational for it to be sellable? Yes. We still have those challenges. And yes. I think that's part of what we are trying to demystify and bring uh, the media houses to understand. Mm -hmm. That is for their own benefit and, uh, and um, uh, you know, like to meet the objectives also as being um, a public educator mm -hmm. on key matters. Yeah. Okay. So what changes do you think, uh, what improvement of the effect of these new changes are uh, at the universities where they are bringing these new courses, where we have a uh, specialist trained in journalism or health communication. And how soon are we, might we see positive changes? Uh, the first, look, uh, every journey is a progress, more so when you have something like this. Yeah. And uh, our first aspect, in fact, our main objective was the outcome of that health communication course in medical schools is to train the doctor to communicate to the patient in a way that the patient will understand mm. uh, where, um, I mean, uh, the, the, the circumstances of their ailment, mm. maybe even what they can do to avoid that going forward. Because <clears throat> if you, because as I've told you that many of the, many of the uh, ailments that uh, are caused us, 70% of them don't need to go to the doctor. Okay? Yes. So one of the, the outcomes we expect from this training is to train the medic how to communicate medicine to the lay person, the patient. That's the fundamental drive of that uh, course. But number two also, as I mentioned that we have uh, that thing of um, uh, training and engaging professionals in communication in media houses. Ah. So for instance, if you cannot get, uh, maybe even if they may not get uh, a medical person to run their help desk on a day-to-day -day basis, they engage them more because they are, I mean, they are already trained in matters of um, communicating health to the public. Okay. Because one thing you, uh, you may also realize that, uh, I don't know about your experience, but uh, there has been that thing of, when you go to a doctor, you just tell him what uh, is, you think he's ailing you, mm. he examines you, maybe in a few minutes he has sent you to the lab, then the next thing is that he gives you um, a prescription. Yes. You, don't, you don't even understand what was ailing you. So even if someone asks you what is, I mean, uh, so what exactly is the problem? Mm. Uh, you hear many people saying, uh, I, well, the doctor knows, 
<laughs> you give me this uh, kind of drugs. <laughs> People don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Or you just give the symptom <laughs> that took you in the first place. Exactly. You know. Yeah. So we need to change that. And that is what we are trying. We are endeavoring to change that day by day and course by course. And I'm hopefully, uh, I mean, and I'm hopeful that as we uh, we try on, we are going to achieve that fully in the, uh, in, uh, in the shortest time possible. At least we have a critical mass of people who can do that. Mm. even in our lay settings. Mm. So you said about 70% of ailments that take people to hospital would mm -hmm. should not have been there in the first place if the people got the right information. Where are they supposed to get this information from? From the doctors now who are being trained how to communicate or the mass media? That is now a challenge, Patrick, because this information, you know, media houses in this country, unfortunately, focus a lot on things that don't quite help us. And I mean, and it's um, because if you look at uh, other um, areas whereby the media has been very successful, like the, uh, say in Europe or the US, mm -hmm. there are specific media houses that tackle specific challenges like health, investment, environment issues, you know, all that, okay? Here we don't have that. And then what we have done is to kill upcoming platforms that deal in such. You remember uh, the first company that we started when I started to, I mean, to interact with you was Health Media International. Yes. It is still there, though now it is part of the larger SS Media Group. But we'll see what has happened over time is that uh, then uh, there's an animal that was brought in by the government called the Government Advertising Agency, GAA. Mm. And that has killed many upcoming media houses. And that is where we have failed mm. as a country um, to encourage um, essential media platforms. I remember mm. also there's another guy, I think there was also sometimes, uh, there was Health TV that also died out because, yeah, you know, Health TV. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. It mm. was there, but it killed. I mean, okay, but it died out again because there was no support. I mean, the the business environment does not support such kind of uh, ventures, which is very unfortunate. Those are the sources which I could say could be very, very key mm. in, um, in in uh, in disseminating this information to the public. Mm. Mm. Because the the mainstream media, we only give it a two minute slot uh, during prime time news, and that is if there's an outbreak. <laughs> Unless it is COVID, which affects everybody, people are not bothered about it. Yeah, and then you see, a crisis this, yes, you know, and I see for us, we are saying that we need this kind of um, platforms. So beyond the media houses, we can also have community health workers and community um, um, informants who will give the public information. Say, like talking to say, like teachers, for instance, who are very influential in uh, um, in the community, mm. right? Mm. We need to engage those people in not just teaching, for instance, but mm. to tell them, talk health to your people. Mm. What happened to the uh, to, 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 to these uh, lessons we used to have about public health in, uh, in our schools? Mm. That have gone. Mm. People need to be taught that. So we even in, uh, need to engage the Ministry of Education mm. and for them to understand that uh, these are courses that can be taught in our schools. Yes. Right? Mm. So it is a whole uh, repertoire of uh, infrastructure to yes. give that information to find the Euro pace, you mm. know. But the first thing is this information needs to be well organized. Yes. In the media houses, like what we are doing ourselves, like what Health TV was doing, and even engage in partnerships with the mainstream media houses to yeah. drive that information home. Okay. A lot of work to be done, but again, who is bailing the cut and who is doing it? I think <laughs> as I was speaking to somebody else, you are making your, your what do you call a hummingbird contribution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. and, yes. And um, I was uh, I was speaking to one of my journalistic colleagues the other day, Thomas Anjo. Maybe you know Thomas Anjo? Ah, I know. I yeah. Know. yeah, Tom is a very good friend. <laughs> yes, I just interviewed him last week. Maybe his, mm -hmm. his interview will come just before yours on, on the on the right. platform. And he has been he has he has recovered. He had a bout of depression. 
and he's has recovered. He's generally recovering. And the thing is that he was telling me that uh, when you are in depression, you may not realize it. You don't know. It's not like a headache or it's not like a flu. You can realize I'm depressed or this is happening, but it kind of comes gradually. And I think there are so many people walking out there who may be under depression, but they are not aware. We are now talking about mental health. And I said earlier on, for those who understand Kiswahili, mental, mental health is even our Zimu. Can you go to there? Can you give, can you give us, you, in a nutshell, what is the situation country, nationwide? I mean, from your own perspective. Uh, one thing, let me just say this. Thomas Sajo, by the way, is a person I, I, I have known for many, many years. Mm. Uh, he was my senior in my undergraduate. Okay. Uh, I, th I think it was about a year or two ahead of me uh, yes. at the university. Yes. And then we crossed again when we were doing our master's in communication. We were actually classmates in that. All right. And we have been good friends, actually. Generally. We, and one thing I like about Tom is that he has been very, very open about his experience, which is what actually we are calling out, men especially, to come out and talk about their own situations and what we have yes. driven them. Mm -hmm. But back to your question about the situation um, in uh, in Kenya today about issues of uh, mental health. I, I would like to focus on mental health. You see, uh, and maybe I make this um, um, clarity that mental health issues is not only depression. Okay. So depression is one of the aspects uh, that informs mental ill health. Right? All right, all right. And uh, the truth of the matter is that all of us have got a degree of mental health challenges. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's the reality. I used to hear that. I used to say, Kilam to Anaka when I was in Kadogo. It's a reality. Uh, what uh, differs is a degree, you know, when, uh, <laughs> you know, um, uh, so what happens is, a but not talking about the critical mental ill health. Mm. We, we, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we may not have the actual figures because it is still a, an area that people are still afraid of getting into or that, okay, we haven't gotten there uh, um, very deeply. Mm. And I'll give you an example of HIV when it came to Kenya in about 1985, the mid 80s, remember? Yes. yes. So we have scant information about it. And then uh, of course, later uh, after the advocates that happened and the interventions that were put in place, then we were able to put facts and figures on the table. Today, yes. Yes. we don't have such. I mean, I can tell you for a fact, because I've dealt a lot with the Department of Mental Health at the Ministry of Health, we mm. don't have actual figures, right? Mm. Mm. But the truth of the matter is that the challenge is rampant. Mm. It's rampant. Yes. And as you said so rightly, is, uh, you know, um, a person who is, I mean, who has got a mental health challenge, is not the only person in Madari, because that's what most people think. Yes. That uh, a person uh, who is um, uh, um, who has got an issue of mental health challenge mm -hmm. is a person in Madari or the person walking around picking takataka and mm -hmm. like, uh, you know with a takataka bag and all that. Eh? Yes. But we find uh, people with serious mental health challenges in our offices, right? Mm -hmm. In our government hierarchies, and you can see that from what is coming out today. You look mm. at our police force. I mm. mean, mm. when a person, uh, uh, a police officer today takes a gun and goes and shoots his colleagues, mm. or he takes a gun and goes and shoots his entire family, that person is not a criminal, by the way. He has a challenge. He or she has a challenge, mm. right? Mm. You can see it with the people who are coming from Somalia, our KDF uh, officers coming from mm. Somalia. Mm. Unless they are well, this is the kind of guy who will come back and they just go quiet. You know, I mean, I know some of them will be my friends. Mm. Either they come and go into their own cocoons, they don't talk to you, or they, be, or they come back and become wild because they have seen a lot that has changed their perspective about, mm. about, uh, about uh, life. You know, you can lose it any time. Okay? Yes. yes. You look into our own families, you know, we have people, men, and I would like to have a special, rather, uh, uh, a space to talk about the man in particular, because you find a lot of uh, this pressure going to the man in a society. Actually, by the way, about 70% of the cases affect men, okay? Mm. So the situation is dire, you know, and it's just that people don't talk about it. It's only now that some people like Thomas Sajjo are coming out and saying, this is actually, this is, uh, this is my experience. Mm. I can tell you for a fact, 
you will be shocked uh, um, um, about the number of people who are just quiet, okay? Who are quietly seeing counselors, who are seeking therapy, mm. right? Mm. But they don't want to come out and talk about their own experiences. But, yes. But, um, and, but from a very, very counselor glance, I can tell you for a fact, even without the facts and figures, mm. the situation is dire. It, need, it, it needs serious, serious interventions. Okay. Okay. You've just mentioned that uh, depression is not the only mental issue. For, for our viewers, we call we say to kind of stress. Somebody is stressed up. Is that depression, or can you give us one or two other issues, or other cases of uh, mental health? The uh, depression has been the general, um, the general, I mean, probably the general definition mm. of um, you know of a person having mental health issues. Okay. Yes. But uh, the truth of the matter is, uh, okay, but now then you need to look at uh, the factors that leads to the mental health challenges. Mm. People, uh, cause people will talk about depression generally uh, to, I mean, the, 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 uh, the lay person will talk about depression or mental health issues, mm -hmm. okay? So to them, they use the word depression and uh, mental health challenges interchangeably. Mm. But there are many factors that cause uh, mental health challenges. You know, we are talking now about uh, some of them may be medical, actually, that somebody may have um, yeah. any medical. clinical issue. Yes. Yeah. Someone may be raped there by what you call stress. Like, I mean, like uh, the last couple of years, people have lost jobs. Mm. Yeah. The, the pressure that comes with it to fit in has caused a lot of people to have, uh, to have mental imbalances. Mm. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to call it depression, I would rather call it uh, mental, um, a mental imbalance. The social pressure to measure up in, you know, uh, only out of social factors, people are getting married, we're still there, you're 35. Mm -hmm. society has that to pressure you, what is wrong with you, you know, all those things. Mm -hmm. uh, you are going through economic hardships, you know, family people break up. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of issues that, you know, today with a lot of separations and, and divorce and all that. Uh, there could be socioeconomic challenges. Even today, as we talk about politics today, there are people who are, are going through a lot of pressure because of that. Mm. So depression is what I call the uh, the blanket lay person's uh, definition yes. of mental ill health. Yeah. And uh, but ordinarily, uh, and and um, talking about it um, um, about it professionally, we have a lot of mental ill health challenges that are not necessarily okay, that people generally um, put a blanket definition as depression mm. which is not the case mm. yeah actually sorry I, I may even add this actually depression is a stage is a stage in the mental ill health process mm. it by itself is not a condition per se okay okay yeah and uh, would you be able to to explain how somebody would know his he has a mental challenge or mental issue? You said there are so many big professionals in government in the corporate world who mm -hmm. are mentally, you know, who have mental challenges or other mental health challenges. Know them. Mm -hmm. Would they know, or do people know? How would I know that that particular person? Is needing that one despite me having no, I'm not going to do this, but <laughs> if I have some challenges, <laughs> mental challenges, or how would I know he's okay? He's just going under, he's just undergoing normal stress, but that one is seriously unwell, or he might he might crop anytime, he might explode anytime. Mm. All right, uh, two things here. Uh, there are the obvious cases that most of us would see. You know, if today I woke up and uh, I get to town and then you find I have removed my shirt, uh, CBD, you say, Georgia Konashida Apa. You know, there are those obvious cases that will, <clears throat> that will uh, be telling that this guy has an issue, yes. right? Yes. Uh, but in most cases, in most cases, and this is a program I would like to talk about later, maybe in the program, mm -hmm. um, the people, the, the people who are actually affected, very few of them will know they have an issue. Very few mm. of them. Mm. But majority of them is the people around them who mm. will start to see telltale signs. Mm. 
Mm. Somebody has been coming to work uh, very well, is there early in the morning, then all of a sudden he has started to drag uh, um, uh, along. The guy was this choir boy in church all through and through, then all of a sudden he has started to miss even uh charge because he's drunk most of the times he wasn't like that before uh a colleague at work um uh, 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 who have been very very consistent in their performance suddenly mm-hmm. they start to to underperform right mm-hmm. uh, a person who uh, who has been very very talkative and very uh social suddenly goes i mean with, uh, um, withdraws mm-hmm. and he becomes irritable for uh, mm-hmm. you know a boss who has been very good and kind and a very, very good mentor, all of a sudden he has become irritable. He throws words around like, mm. uh, you know, you can tell this person, I mean, there's something wrong with this person, you know. <laughs> but the people who are affected themselves, very, very few of them actually will take the initiative to admit their own situation. In fact, they may not even know. Mm. And they, and of course, it will start. Um, mm. I'll give an example. Today, I have an issue with, uh, with my spouse. And because I don't want to get home early to meet her, <laughs> I start to pass by uh, a, a certain club or pub. Okay, is the people who um, who are, okay? And maybe because I have a lot of things that I do over the week, then I start because I have started to get home at midnight is a weekday. I start to get late at work, right? So I may think that is a normal thing because I'm dealing with it from um, an internal perspective. It's only my colleague who we, uh, who we realize, hey, George does not drink. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what came of him? You know, he's, I mean, he started, I mean, he's, I mean, uh, 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 he's a guy who is uh, going, uh, who is in the office normally at 7 a.m. Now he comes at 9 and even just does around, you know. So in most cases, in most cases, unless for those very obvious uh, situations, I mean, somebody, I look where she's got this, you can tell, you know. Mm-hmm. Many people may not realize uh, uh, themselves. If the people around them who mm-hmm. will actually uh, uh, start to detect. Yes. I'll give an example. Um, and, 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 and just before I end that point, if that is part of the drive we have with the corporates, there is, a, uh, okay, before we even get to talk about the Kenya, it's, uh, it's one of the things that we actually driving corporates to create structures of detection and reporting and addressing issues of mental health challenges amongst colleagues at the office or the workplace. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. because like now last year we had uh, two people from an organization which I may not mention here. They are uh, there. People start to say, okay, actually those two guys committed suicide. Same organization mm-hmm. is a government organization. Okay, it's only after they are. I mean, they have committed suicide that now people will start saying, hey, by the way, and I saw that guy had an issue. But you see, they never talked at that time. Yeah. And what do, uh, don't they talk about it? Because there are no structures to report. Mm-hmm. So if I say, I realize Patrick has an issue, then it's like, well, what should we do? Mm. Okay? It's true. But if this is, yeah, but if this is, but if we have structures within corporates uh, and at yes. the workplace, and that of people can actually, yes, yeah, yeah, even the institutions actually, you know, mm. like when you see people, <clears throat> Even in schools, as you say, uh, as the writers say, people around you are the ones who are likely to realize. But why do they keep quiet about it? Because they are not sure of how they are, they are um, how to put it, uh, how their concerns are going to be taken. Yes. Because somebody might think this guy, I mean, uh, strobing no say, right? Mm-hmm. But when this is made for more, that you know, I can report a colleague of mine to his HR maybe and tell them, I think this guy has an issue. So it's taken up and then it's dealt with um, confidentially and uh, with care because that's also what most people fear. Mm. They fear they fear that they're going to be exposed, right? Yeah, yeah. So and ridiculed. And ridiculed. Yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yes. So people yes. Uh, start by because of that. So it takes the colleague mm. or the people around the family members to realize this person has an issue and we need to deal with it. Okay. And I know because also I'm also involved in counseling profession. I also know that uh, it's, not only, uh, it's not only adults who undergo stress and depression, particularly the adolescents to that, even, even children. Can you talk a bit about that? How maybe we can assist our children or realize my child or my young girl, our young adolescent daughter or 
son is undergoing depression or stress. Right, I can say this uh, for a fact. Uh, actually, adults may have mechanisms to cope with it because it's been there for longer and when it reaches the end, people just go. <clears throat> Our children also, the challenge actually lies with the parents and the guardians. And, um, and on this one, Patrick, there's no two way about it. We simply have to be present in our children's lives. Yes. Okay? This has no two way about it. Because you realize we have been so much um, into the workplace, we, are, we make ourselves too busy looking for money, we neglect our kids, so they are normally under the guidance of the teacher or the house help. Yes. Most parents, most guardians are absent in the children's lives. They think that um, paying for the upkeep in their school fees is enough. It's not. The children, uh, we, we simply have to be talking to them. And like today, I'll tell you for a fact, you have heard about cases whereby, um, like a child uh, has gotten in, into substance abuse, for instance. Yes. Or they have gotten into some weird, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, more so sexually. Uh, you know, there's molestation around, but they, uh, but they don't talk. Yes. yes. But if the, the parent or the guardian have had time with this child. Yeah. For them, I mean, they'll be, I mean, they'll open up. It will be easier yes. for them to, uh, to detect. To open up. Yeah. Uh, yes, to open up. And even if, like, right at the onset, like things like bullying, for instance, if a child has been bullied at school, for instance, or by um, a raw neighbor child uh, there or wherever it is, eh? or by the house elf, or, or even by a teacher, they would likely open up to a guardian or parent who is, uh, who is their friend. Yes. Okay, who has been there for them. Yes. And I may tell you for a fact, like, um, 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 like now I'm very, very amused sometimes when I talk about it, uh, this CBC being the CBC um, um, model of education. Mm. Because, the, I mean, there's been a lot of hue and cry by many, many parents. <laughs> I'm all the parent helping and, homework. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you see, that, you know why the, uh, these guys are making noise about CBC? Because, because they're never because there. That's the point. Yes. But now they're being forced, you have to be there for your yes. child. You cannot yes. leave the, your, your... Kitambo could fight even the kids that are doing their homework with the house help. Yes. Yeah? Uh, so the child is basically under the care of the teacher who has got 40 other kids to take um, care of in a, um, in a classroom. Mm -hmm. Or the house help who has been paid uh, some few coins every other month to do that, eh? who is not even maybe competent enough to do with that. Now, when the parents have been forced to be there in their children's lives, they're making noise about it. And for me, I'm saying, okay, the CBC may have its challenges, but I think one of the things that it has done <laughs> is to bring the parents back to the lives of their children. So, uh, back to your question. Yes. <laughs> There's no two way about it. Parents and guardians have to be present in their children's lives to detect uh, um, challenges where they are coming up and to know how to counter them. It's true. It's true. I, I usually get amused when uh, during uh, this, the beginning of a long school holiday, you see all over the social media, parents complaining, what are we going to do with this? They're coming back They're here. You, you, think they, <laughs> you think these are pirates or some thugs coming home, but it's their own children. <laughs> and, and, and again, oh, Patrick. <laughs> yeah. And again, Yes, and again, um, these are your children. You have to be friends with them, as you say. And there are some parents, when a child has finished from four, they're about to go to college, they realize they, they are strangers. Because since class one, since pre-unit, since class one, since the whole primary, I'm a corner maid. And these maids, mm -hmm. and so on. And then the kids go to boarding, and then suddenly when these are from four, they don't know each other. And that's, I think, where the problem starts, in particular when, and I think that was seen during the school burnings. These kids were giving us a message. Very true, very true. And, I, uh, and as uh, you have actually said, you know, the, the challenge has been, as I said, the absence of parents and guardians in the lives of their children. And we have been thinking that since I can pay school fees for my kids, I pay for the upkeep, that's enough. 
Actually, you, 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 and you know what has been happening is that even during the school holidays, parents pay for tuition. Tuition. That, that tuition actually is a way of saying, because you have relieved the burden of parenthood to other, I mean, you, 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 uh, so you have a kind of uh, let go your role as a parent yes. to the teacher and to the house help. So even yes. when it's on holiday, yes. you have to pay the teacher a little bit more so they can keep guard of your children. And yeah, that is what I'm saying. And, that and has to stop. Away, and keep them away from yes. stabbing you. <laughs> yes, you know, because people, you, I mean, the other day I had a very interesting discussion with somebody who was complaining mm. that now he has, uh, 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 that now he has no more social life because he has to come home early and supervise the children's um, homework. Sometimes he's called at the office and told that you have to come with one, two, three items so we can accomplish this, uh, this homework. He feels like he has been enslaved now. Okay? <laughs> and this is your child, Patrick. I mean, yeah. this, <laughs> this is your child. Yeah. 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 yeah and so, these, are the, these are the kind of children we are bringing up. And uh, people used to say, what's wrong with the children of today? What's wrong with the youth of today? We should be asking, what's wrong with the parents of today? Not the youth. Exactly. The youth follow, You're so right. Yeah. The youth follow what we do or how we behave. Mm -hmm. yes. That is so now, true. I mean, <laughs> yes, yes. let's go to Tunza Kenya uh, as we wind up. What mm -hmm. is Tunza Kenya? Right. Why Tunza mm -hmm. Kenya and what are you doing about? I mean, what's all about? Tunza Kenya has got two components. Uh, there's Tunza Kenya, the program, which has got uh, four main pillars. Uh, and we have got um, a component of it called Unshackled. Um, Unshackled uh, is a man to man talk. I'll come there. Tools the Kenya itself is a platform, is a non-for-profit platform that we have um, established to mitigate on matters of mental health, right? And very briefly, uh, if you give me some one, two minutes, just to explain those four pillars which informs Tools the Kenya. Of course, it came from the background, as I've explained before, that we realized there are too many issues about mental health issues, uh, but nobody is taking a comprehensive approach to address them. So the first pillar to the Kenya is advocacy and awareness. Mm. People need to understand, uh, number one, what is mental ill health? As we have discussed a while ago, I mean, is it only when someone has gone to Madari? Or I mean, uh, people need to understand those, uh, those aspects, even to detect what, I mean, like we have I talked in this program before, uh, um, um, that people around you can even understand, uh, can, try to, uh, can start to detect that mm. this person is not the same person anymore. So we yes. need to advocate about people being aware about it. Eh? Mm -hmm. Then, um, pillar number two is when these people come out as they have been approaching us, what happens to them? You know, what do we do with them? So the second pillar is that we have raised a network of professionals and institutions mm -hmm. that we are working with. Mm -hmm. So when these people come out, we direct them, we refer them to the professionals and to the institutions where they can get help. Yes. Okay, and that's pillar number two. Uh, pillar number three, just briefly, is to institute long-term interventions. Okay, uh, you know this country we are in this habit of um, um, running. Uh, 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 it's called what? Locking the stable after the horse has bolted. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what we normally do. But we're saying, how can we have a preventative approach mm -hmm. to these challenges that we have? Because, for instance, if you establish that. People in, um, say, in Moranga or Kembu, where some of us have, have come from and have witnessed first hand mm. use of, say, alcoholism, right? Yes. What is causing these young men, for instance, uh, in Moranga, where I come from myself, I could go home at about 8 a.m. in the morning. It's a, week, um, it's, a, um, um, it's a weekday. You find guys who are drunk at 8 in that in the morning. Mm. It's a working day. Okay? Yes. What is making these people get to that kind of hopelessness, mm. right? Mm -hmm. That when they come and do some uh, some little work for you and you pay them some two five hundred shillings, the first drop is that the, um, uh, at those Changa dens. Yeah, mm -hmm. what makes them do that? Okay, if for instance, uh, I, I, and I'll give you a very good example about that because every empowerment program that we have today, go to the community, is uplifting the woman, the girl shard, mm -hmm. and maybe some few youth groups that are there. Yes. The man is largely neglected, right? 
So how can we do these kind of uh, interventions to ensure the man also is, uh, is economically engaged? Because you realize if these people are constructively engaged, you won't find them going to the bar in the morning. In okay. fact, by the, by the end of the day, they'll be so tired and looking forward for the next day. So they won't even have got the time to go to those pubs, right? Sure. So those are the, so that's just uh, one example of, uh, of our pillar number three, that we have long-term interventions to, um, to, uh, to counter this kind of uh, uh, challenges. Yeah. Fourthly, and maybe the most ambitious pillar that we have is to putting up a physical one-stop facility Mm. which will converge all these things, right? Mm. Uh, so that facility is, uh, is, is, is a we, we hope uh, or that we project in the next three to five years, it will be up and running, mm. that we have a clinical side, mm. we have a resource center, because mm. today you still able to, to talk about mental health, they go to Google, even uh, in Kenya or Bahari, yeah? So we have a resource center, we have a training arm of the same that we have trained our own people on how to deal with the unique challenges of mental health that we have in our country, okay. right? Mm. Uh, that, I mean, so that's what we, so that's the, uh, the, the four main pillars of, of, mm. of, of Atunza Kenya. <clears throat> and, uh, and without prejudice, honestly, uh, we launched it officially about a month ago, mm. but it has been running uh, as a program, mm. okay? Mm. Uh, yeah, so now we have Tunza Kenya running uh, officially mm. with those four main pillars. And, uh, and, 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 and I can tell you for a fact, as I said, we are, we, without prejudice, because I'm there, mm. I have not mm. encountered any other formation that have come with such a comprehensive approach mm. to addressing matters of mental ill health in Kenya like we have done. And, uh, and, and for me, it's a matter of, uh, it's, uh, and we have our partners whom we are um, um, going on with. And uh, yeah, we are there now. So that's basically the brief about Uza Kenya. Mm. And then the component number two, which I take uh, about a minute to describe, is something we are called, is a program we are calling Unshackled. Unshackled. Yes. You know, Unshackled is a man to man talk. Mm. And the reason we are dwelling a lot of time on this one is because we realize, again, over 70% of the cases that you find about homicide, suicide, drug abuse, affect the man. Mm. And why? Because the man will go through a lot of pressure, but they do not talk. We don't talk. Mm. You know, you have issues that your family, what you do, you'd rather go to the pub and get drunk, <laughs> okay? Mm. Or go to substance abuse. You have issues with your wife? You look for a girlfriend who, I mean, who causes you more trouble. Mm. <laughs> and then after all that, still you do not talk, you know. Mm. So we are telling men, so basically a shackled is a program that is calling out men from the dark corners, right? Mm. Mm. And telling them fundamentally is okay not being okay. So let's talk about uh, these issues. Mm. And let's look for solutions, okay? Mm. Because one of the things that you realize, Patrick, is uh, we have a lot of uh, imbalance now, you know, more so socioeconomically. Whereby yes. today, very many men today are trying to refine themselves, you know, in the face of the empowered uh, woman who has got their own money. You know, Kitamba, we used to have men define themselves by the ability to provide uh, um, for their families, mm. right? Today, you realize and out of the interaction I've had with very many people who have come to us in this uh, platform, very, very many men today are having self-doubts because you've got a wife who is possibly earning more than you, if not having um, her own money. Uh, basically, he, uh, she doesn't quite need you. I mean, <laughs> so when the, the man is faced with this kind of uh, new socioeconomic di uh, dispensation, mm -hmm. they lose themselves. Right, is like their value has been lost. Mm. Yet society expects them to be like their fathers and grandfathers. You are the man, you are the provider, you are supposed to be doing this, you are the protector of the family. You are mm. okay, you go through uh, through uh, a difficult time, you're supposed to man up and not even uh, cry, or you know, you don't let go your emotions. And that's why you're finding many of these men when they they get at their breaking point. Mm. They do atrocious things. Someone wakes up one day and kills the entire family. It's yeah, true. because of mm. that pressure. And we're telling men, mm. come out of the cocoons, come out of those dark corners. And at the same time, we are telling the women, 
things have changed and you need to change your perspective about how we uh, relate with the man of today because that's a reality. So in brief, that is what we're trying to do with both to the Kenyan and uh, Ashako, and you can only hope that things are going to get better. Okay, that's a very interesting uh, point, particularly on the this component of Ashako, because as you said, men spend most of their time, men with problems, they spend most of their time in dark room, as I say, developing negatives. <laughs> <laughs> But then you're so right. You're so yes. right about that one. <laughs> yes. And so yeah. I, I like it when you say, okay, they stay in dark corners, but then we need to let them know that it's okay not to be okay. So that mm -hmm. they accept themselves and then start moving and look for solutions. Yeah. True. And, and I think uh, here, I think it's a lot of work because I think the whole society, the whole community need to be re-educated. The money is lost. Mm -hmm because he finds himself in a very peculiar situation. He's supposed to be a provider. Since we were young, that's what we are told. But then here you are, either you have lost your job or you have your job, but your wife is earning more than you. As you say, she doesn't need you. So who are you? Exactly. Yeah. In fact, actually, that is the main, main, main reason. I mean, okay, it may not be empirical as yet, but mm. I can tell you for a fact, even from a Catholic glance at what is happening around, yes. that's the main disconnect. Sure. And one main contributor, because you have the man who is not able to, I mean, who is kind of lost and uh, is asking himself questions about his own irrelevance. Mm. And we have a woman who is yet to understand, I mean, uh, who is yet to, 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 okay, and this is the truth. Uh, we have got a woman who is yet to define some mission, even when they are earning more than their, uh, their husbands may be, yes. or they are in a more um, economically empowered position than their yes. spouses. Yes. Or even need both of them are earning, uh, maybe almost equally, or uh, or even the man is earning more. The woman also has got their own money in a way that now I don't quite need you. I mean, I can I I I I I, I can do my stuff without you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the main disconnect that we have, uh, that is, yeah, that indeed. informs largely yes. uh, the kind of things that we are facing today. Yeah. So as I as I was saying, I think the whole the whole society need to be re-educated of the situation, not really re-educated, but affirm what is happening because they know, but many are closing their eyes. And there are many women who are okay, who are more understanding and they treat True, their, yeah. you know, their unemployed uh, or husbands well. But there are those others who still push and you have to provide whether you have your door, you have to go, which is okay. You have to go out and find something. Mm -hmm. You don't uh, sit there and uh, hide behind your wife's cards. Mm. You have to do something. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's not possible. And therefore, there's that need for understanding one another. So you, you just mentioned that uh, that uh, Tunza, Tunza Kenya was launched recently. How long ago was that? And how come we haven't- About a month ago. About a month ago. And how come we haven't heard about it? Was it in the press? <laughs> Right. Yeah, it was quite. Uh, it was, <laughs> yeah, actually, it was. Uh, how do you put it? It was a very um, a successful event. Actually, it was in the press. Oh. Uh, we held it. At, we, we held it at the Tamarit uh, about a month ago. Yeah. But what we were doing actually, uh, we were just announcing to the world. Mm. Here we have a problem. Mm. Uh, it can be resolved in this and this way. Yes. And we, as Tunza Kenya, we have taken the initiative to do this. So what we're asking our partners is for mm. the support mm. as, we, uh, as we move forward and to tell people, let's talk about this. Let's yes. create uh, tangible solutions for, our, for the challenges that we face. Mm. And uh, yeah, that's what we are, uh, we are basically doing. Yeah, but yes, it was uh, there in the press, um, in the media. And, and we are moving on. So they didn't uh, uh, invite you. Maybe it was bigger than five thousand. You should have. I can no own them because I, uh, I owe you one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fine. No problem because uh, we had yeah. previously discussed with you because they may want, they may be one or two things I may want to contribute in the whole process. Yes. But yeah. before we go on, before we start winding up, I would. Uh, the curiosity is, uh, who is Tunza Kenya? 
Is it an NGO? Is it a corporate body? And who, who is behind it? And uh, all that? Or is it part of what you have been doing all along with your magazines and other, you know, communication, uh, you know, publications? Uh, yes, uh, Tunza Kenya is a non-government organization. It's a, um, it is an NGO. Okay. And as, a, and as I have explained, we realized when we, uh, before we used to do it as a program, I mean, as an, um, an outreach program uh, from our other company, okay? But we realized this is a huge, huge, huge challenge that uh, this, it can't run um, as a program at any other entity. Mm. So we, I personally went out of my way. Mm. I invited a few people who I thought we could work around with in, in um, establishing the uh, the organization. Mm. So it's only last year that we got the certification as a non-government organization, as an right. NGO. So okay. as an independent board, mm. uh, uh, we have uh, people running. We have a person who is running it on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes, I have shifted from my main job at SS Media to come mm. and assist the setting up of uh, Tools of Kenya. So I'm part okay. of the uh, the initiators. Mm. So yes, that's who, uh, who we are, is an NGO, and uh, we look forward to mitigating matters of mental ill health in Kenya and for us beyond. Fine. So you have all that advocacy, prevention, uh, prevention professional institution, network, long-term intervention, and so on. If anybody wants to come and talk to you or look for you as Tuza Kenya, how would they do it? We are. We have a physical office in in Nairobi West. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, we have our contacts for the office, which which I, I don't have offhand, but which I can yes. give you. You can put it later. Yes. Uh, you can also get in touch with me. Okay. Uh, as a person, I think you've got my contacts, which you can give. I mean, I have no problem with that. All right. Yeah. You can you you you, uh, you, you can talk to us. We also have a website uh, yes. to the .org. Zakia.org. Yes, uh, okay. we have, uh, uh, so we have um, an email address that is geared purely towards um, public communication. It is there. Somebody will attend to that. Yeah. Yeah, so we have that. But if you want to get into more directly, you can talk to me in a day. Fine, fine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, George. So we know. Uh, Sandy, Sandy, Patrick. <laughs> so our, our viewers, we've been following you on Facebook and other places know more about you and even those who have not met you, those who have never met you, they know what you are doing, particularly as far as the health generating concern and uh, mental health issues. And it's been a great pleasure having you at Bliss Oasis Africa. And uh, maybe I'll give you one more moment so that you can give you a last word before we close. Uh, thank you. I mean, we have got, you know, uh, the human person is a bad of many things. I mean, the human person is basically a social animal, right? I say that. Yeah. So what we need to do is also to look out for each other, um, especially men. And I keep insisting upon men because that's where we have got the, the biggest challenge. Mm. Look, out for, uh, look out for the people around you. Uh, this life is not... Uh, for the individual, we, I mean, it only makes sense when we are, when you are healthy. You know, like today we have got a lot of um, uh, challenges in matters for health. I, I I don't know how many groups you are in today that uh, uh, that are demanding something from you so they can put it into health uh, mm -hmm. perspective. Maybe somebody is sick and all that. Yeah. yeah. So let's look out for each other. I mean, after all, we are going to leave this world with nothing. So let's be, <laughs> and, and, and especially in this political season, yes. I, I, um, I'm appealing to, uh, to our uh, fellow countrymen and women, please let's yeah. know there's life after elections. Of course. And none of the politicians who is coming to you today of will ever put uh, um, um, a plate of food on your table. So let's not forget that we have got life after the elections. It'll be peaceful. Whatever side uh, or divide you are you are into, let's remain one as Kenya. Let's keep the peace. Yes. There's always life after election. Kenya will always be there. And uh, that's, that's being social animal, taking care of each other is a great advice. Particularly when it comes to 
our mental health. And sometimes we see people in the house, maybe suddenly they are locking up themselves. Maybe you think they don't want to be disturbed. Something to be disturbing them. And you may want to either report or talk to them. So thank you very much, George. Um, I'll be coming to you again through the other line so that we can talk about this more because it's an area I'm really interested in, as you know. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, yes. Asante, uh, Sanadu. Asante. So welcome again. Uh, and have a nice time and I wish all the best with you Now, mm -hmm. continue with a good job and all the best. Thank you very much, Patrick, for the invite. Uh, and, and we look forward to meeting you again. Thank you very much. Asante, Sanadu. Thank you.